In the popular imagination, Charles Darwin supposedly proved evolution. This is why we speak of Darwin's theory of evolution. This is not quite the right way to say it, though. At the risk of sounding pedantic, what Darwin did was to propose a theory for how evolution worked. That's why Darwin's ideas are more properly termed a theory of evolution by natural selection. The distinction is important because there's another important evolutionist that we need to know. That person is a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet, Chevalier de Lamarck. We're too lazy to say that long name all the time, so we now more commonly know him by his shortened title, Lamarck. Lamarck is often portrayed as someone who anticipated the phenomenon of evolution, gave Darwin the idea, so to speak, but muddled the mechanism. As we'll see, that's a pretty significant distortion. In most textbooks of evolution, Lamarck is credited with a wrong-headed idea of heredity. This is usually labeled as the inheritance of acquired characters. Let's illustrate this with a well-known caricature of the idea. A blacksmith works all his life and develops massive muscles in his right arm. If this character acquired during the blacksmith's life was inherited, Lamarck would say that his sons should therefore be born with muscular right arms. At this point, everyone usually has a good laugh. Stupid Lamarck. And then there's the story of the long neck of the giraffe. Lamarck would say, we are told, that giraffes have long necks because their short-necked ancestors were always reaching for the high leaves on trees, and this made their necks grow as they stretched. Their offspring would then have slightly longer necks than usual, and as they stretched their necks, their offspring would have longer necks still. Over time, the long-necked giraffe evolves. This is sounding like one of Kipling's Just So stories. Again, quite comical. Lamarck's evolutionary thinking was actually much more sophisticated than this. If we're to understand Lamarck properly, and Darwinism properly for that matter, we have to know what Lamarck actually thought, rather than what his detractors might want us to think. First, we need to know something about Lamarck and his times. Lamarck, the young man, was a war hero in one of France's wars with Prussia, and as a reward was granted a royal pension, which allowed him to study natural history, which he had always loved. Ultimately, this landed him a position as caretaker of the Royal Botanical Gardens in Paris. His official title there was Curator of Worms. When the French Revolution came, he managed to keep both his position and his head, quite a feat for those tumultuous times. Lamarck was an original and creative thinker, but this needs to be put into the context of his times. For example, oxygen had only been recently discovered. Most scientists still believed in phlogiston. There was little knowledge of living chemistry, of heredity, of genes, and of how embryonic development worked. Lamarck, like nearly all his contemporaries, had what we now call an essentialist view of life. By this, we mean that living things were thought to be animated by a special kind of vital stuff, vis essentialis, they called it, that organized dead matter into living organisms through various kinds of vital forces. These vital forces were thought to explain two major problems in biology. The first was how living things, in all their complexity, managed to grow from formless dead matter. Just think of the development of a living chick from the formless blob of a freshly laid egg. The second was how living things could adapt to changing circumstances. How, for example, did the blacksmith's arm know to build muscle when it was worked? How did a bird's body know to put on extra plumage and fat when the weather got cold? To Lamarck and others, these phenomena could be accounted for by two vital forces. The first was the so-called complexifying force, le pouvoir de la vie, which drove the organization of living matter into ever more complex forms. Embryonic development, growth, and maturity were the outcome of the complexifying force molding the body. Death resulted from the loss of this force. The other was the adaptive force. I won't even try to pronounce the French. 
This caused vitally organized matter to remodel itself according to the demands of changing circumstances. The adaptive force is what drove the blacksmith's arm to bulk up as it was worked harder. When the adaptive force failed, disease followed. Among Lamarck's contemporaries, nearly all agreed that these forces operated within individuals. Today, we might say the science was settled. So these forces weren't a particularly original idea of Lamarck's. What did make him original, though, was his proposal that these forces could operate to shape the evolution of lineages of organisms as well as individuals. Thus, if we follow the evolution of a lineage of, say, worms, which Lamarck knew well, one should see an ever-increasing complexity in the species with time. And, as the world's environment changed over long periods of time, which by Lamarck's time it was known that it did, then one should see adaptive change in a lineage so that its body form tracked the changes in the world in which the lineage lived. In short, Lamarck proposed the first operational theory for how evolution actually worked. And what he proposed was actually quite profound and far from the popular caricature of simply being the inheritance of acquired characters. He proposed that there was a fundamental similarity between organismal development and evolutionary change. So how precisely does Darwinism differ from Lamarckism as we're told it does? The surprising answer is, not by much. Where the two primarily differ is over the driver of evolutionary change. Where Lamarck saw an active progressivism in lineages, driven by the intentional strivings of individuals for survival, Darwin saw more of a lottery at work. There was natural variation within each generation of organisms. Some of this variation was heritable from the previous generation. And some individuals, by virtue of this inheritance, were simply better suited to life than others. It was these favored variations that were naturally selected. Despite this, there was actually a great deal of similarity between Lamarck's and Darwin's evolutionary thinking, which today tends to be obscured. For example, both saw adaptation as a central feature of the evolutionary process, and both were convinced there had to be some means of linking adaptation within individuals with adaptation in evolving lineages. Darwin even came up with his own mechanism for how these could be connected, and his theory, which he called pangenesis, was pure Lamarckism, at least as we lampoon it today. Indeed, if anyone deserves to be tarred with a brush of inheritance of acquired characters, it's Darwin, not Lamarck. Why then is Darwin now on top and Lamarck relegated to the fringes? This is the product of a radical philosophical shift that took place in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, in the emergence of what we now call Neo-Darwinism. What happened then was a shift in focus away from adaptation and toward mechanisms of heredity as the driver of evolutionary change. We can point to three major developments that led to this. The first was the emergence of a credible theory of heredity, in particular the concept of the Mendelian gene as the sole repository of hereditary memory. This set much of biology on the path to uncovering the material nature of the gene culminating in the 1950s with the discovery of the structure of DNA, its mechanisms of replication, and expression of function. What followed from this was the central dogma of molecular biology. The second was the embryological work of the German biologist August Weismann, who proposed the so-called theory of germline segregation. What Weismann meant by this was that heredity operated solely through a lineage of cells within the body tasked with reproduction. This he called the germline, which in sexually reproducing animals were the haploid sperm and eggs. The cells of the rest of the body, the soma, existed only to provide nutritional support to the germline. This doctrine erected an insurmountable barrier between physiological adaptation, which took place in the soma only, and evolutionary adaptation, which could only occur through the germline. The third was the reconciliation of Mendelian genetics and population genetics with natural selection. This one takes a little explaining. 
When the Mendelian gene was first rediscovered in the 1900s, this was thought by many to be the death sentence for Darwinism because genes were conservative agents that resisted change, the exact opposite of what Darwin was trying to explain. Population genetics, which was the science of how genes behaved in populations of individuals, said essentially the same thing. In a population of breeding individuals, the mixes of various types of genes would be reset to the same mix at every generation. You may know this as the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. In the 1920s, though, the British geneticist Ronald Fisher worked out that selection against particular variants of a gene could change its frequency of occurrence in a population. In short, genetics at any level could be reconciled with Darwinian natural selection. Out of these three developments emerged what we now call the Neo-Darwinian synthesis, or more descriptively, the genetical theory of natural selection. This theory puts the focus on the selection of genes, not individuals, as the principal mechanism of evolutionary change. And this pushed evolutionary adaptation right out of the picture, and with it, the adaptation that was central to both Lamarck and Darwin. So by the conventional wisdom, Lamarck is discredited on three major grounds. First, there's the central dogma of molecular biology. This designates the gene as the sole repository of hereditary memory and as the ultimate specifier of function in the living organism. Function, adaptive or not, can only stream from the gene and there can be no feedback of function onto the gene. The second is the segregation of genes residing in the germline from genes residing in the soma. This means that any change in the soma, whether it's physiological or genetic, cannot feed back and modify genes in the germline. Finally, there's the neo-Darwinist claim that the gene is the sole legitimate object of natural selection, and that evolution proceeds only by selection on populations of genes. In this view, individual organisms are simply the carriers of these genes within populations and the transitory vehicles that allow genes and populations to mix. This is the doctrine of the selfish gene, namely that interests of genes prevail over interests of individuals. This means that physiological adaptation, which operates in the vehicles, and evolutionary adaptation, which operates in genes in the germlines, are radically different processes. For much of the 20th century, these three principles were regarded as so well established that Lamarckism, indeed any adaptive theory of evolution, simply could not be true. Science has never settled though, and what we are coming now to realize is that all three are either demonstrably false or are so narrowly cast that no general theory of evolution could possibly emerge from it. That's mostly a topic for another time, but let's address them briefly now. Let's turn first to that claim that the gene is the sole repository of hereditary memory. Let's think about what memory is. One thing it is, is a remembrance of the past. In evolution, the memory in the gene is a record of what worked in previous generations. Selected genes are memories of what had worked well in previous generations. But memory is also something more. At the time a memory is formed, it's a means actually of biasing the future. A gene sitting in a fertilized egg is ensuring that the organism that later develops from it will function in a certain way. Looked at in this way, it now becomes possible for all sorts of things besides genes to qualify as hereditary memory. This is easiest to see in the education of the young. A child just born carries within it a bundle of genes inherited from its parents. These will affect the child's future development and future reproductive success. But its parents also transmit a body of knowledge to that child as it grows that is not carried in the parent's genes. And this will also bias the child's future development and most likely future reproductive success in ways that are not inherent in any gene or in any germline. In fact, this line of reasoning applies to any kind of culture, 
and cultural evolution is, in general, Lamarckian, not Darwinian, in character. The argument has been made that this is a special case because culture should only be found among animals with highly developed nervous systems, like humans or perhaps the higher primates. But as we learn more about culture, this seems to be ever more false. Indeed, culture in a variety of forms appears to be a general feature of life. Even a mat of bacteria in a mudflat can be said to have a culture of sorts. If this is so, Lamarckian evolution may be more general than we think. How about that whole germline segregation thing? This actually is a surprisingly weak argument against Lamarckian evolution. For one thing, it should apply only to organisms that actually have germ lines, which is tantamount to saying it should only apply to sexually reproducing animals. This also means the converse, that it cannot apply to organisms that do not have distinctive germ lines. This includes nearly all bacteria and protists, fungi and plants, most of the diverse life forms on the planet. And even among the animals, we're learning that the segregation of the germline varies widely among different species, and that the soma does, in fact, have quite a lot of influence over the actual definition of genes in the cells that eventually become the eggs and sperm. And this leads us to our final fallacy, that genes are the ultimate specifier of function. This is tantamount to saying that the arrows in the central dogma only ever point one way. We call this genetic determinism. As we've come to know more about the nature of the gene and how it interacts with the cellular milieu that surrounds it, the central dogma is looking less and less believable. What seems to be replacing it is a mutually interdependent system whereby every component of the cell, DNA, RNA, and proteins can influence and define each other. This epigenetic system, as it's called, is emerging as the more likely alternative to the strict genetic system of the central dogma. And this opens a door to at least the possibility of Lamarckian evolution. What all this means is that the emerging sciences of genetics, epigenetics, and embryonic development are looking more and more congenial to a Lamarckian outlook on evolution where the emphasis is on adaptation of organisms, or even organism-like systems, like social insects or ecosystems, as a significant driver of the evolutionary process. In contrast, the neo-Darwinian dogma, namely that selection of genes is the sole process underlying evolution, is looking less and less in tune with this emerging science. This is not to say, of course, that gene selectionism is wrong, just that it needs to share the stage with organismal adaptation. And it's a testimony to Charles Darwin's genius that science is returning evolutionism to the classical form of Darwinism as Darwin himself conceived it, namely as an adaptive and not a genetic theory of evolutionary change. <laughs>